Uh, and you know, they always say, uh, talented people borrow, geniuses steal. So, but don't steal from me. <laughs> so, Antony Meds, that comes from, um, from Nietzsche. He wrote it at a moment when, as in all the things he's been writing, uh, he was also trying to get away from this either or, this, that, but he was not impressed with the moods in which the dialectic presented itself. So the course is, is in a certain sense, paying homage to Nietzsche. It's also paying homage to Michel Foucault, who you'll, if you haven't heard of before, you will hear of a lot in this course. And also people like Kathy Acker uh, or Karen Barad. Kathy Acker is a novelist who passed away in 97. Uh, Karen Barad is a um, physicist uh, living in um, Santa, Santa Cruz. Oh, which reminds me, on the 17th of February, did everybody get the message? 17th of February, uh, Isabel Stengers is speaking uh, in Notting Hill. Uh, no, Notting Hill. Sorry. Notting, oh, Nottingham. Nottingham uh, Contemporary Gallery, whatever it's called, Nottingham it's Contemporary. On the, huh? It's on the same day. Of what? No, no, the seminar is going to be there. Oh, we're gonna, we're, she, she's going to meet with us. It'll be very interesting. So just let me know if you can't come, really. I'll just assume that you are coming. Um, we've got 30 tickets, and we can always get more. Um, the, it's on here, the 17th of February. Um, but we'll be quite far along. Now, what makes this course quite timely in its untimely notations is that it does get into a lot of things that let's say, would underscore or underline the Charlie Hebdo scenario, would be somehow involved with uh, questions of freedom of speech, and how do you, how do you, move, the, how do you move the goalpost in your direction? If, if there is no frame, but there kind of is a game, how do you do this both individually and collectively? It's trying to get at those kind of levels of questions. And it's doing it by bringing in, uh, by moving away from dialectics as such as the, you know, <coughs> I'll go through it again so you remember what dialectic is, but not the it, but dialectics, and we'll go into what will be called rhizomatic method, which is kind of an oxymoron because the rhizomatic isn't really a method. It's sort of an anti-method. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. The main interlocutors in this course are uh, if you will, we'll go back to the front page in a second. But if you just turn to the the second page, no, yeah, the sec second page where it says the central readings. Now everything should be in books PDF. So if you're not online with books PDF, let me know. We're thinking of coming up with a smaller books PDF, you know, baby books PDF or PDF A or something like that, because there's so many books now on books PDF that's forcing people to buy into Dropbox evil. So um, I'm just there must be another way to set this up, but at the moment, let me know if you if it's just too much because we'll have to come up with some other right plan. But anyway, so everything that's on here should be in the PDF box or should be in the library or both. Um, so the essential readings I tried to break it down. I wanted to break it down to four, but you see I didn't sort of I didn't really do that. Um, so let me just go through that. Uh, obviously, Kathy Acker. And I, it's not all Kathy Acker's work, although that's, that's quite interesting. For those of you who are doing literary sort of angle to your work, then Kathy Acker will be quite interesting. Uh, Walter Benjamin, um, Art in the Age of Technological Reproducibility. That's a different translation, so get that translation. Not Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, but Art in the Age of um, Technological Reproducibility. Uh, because the notion of the machine is replaced with the notion of technological. And that's a better translation than what was there before. Anyway, uh, Joseph Boys and the, the kind of artists that are linked with Boys are, are uh, we're also paying homage to. Fluxus, this, uh, anyway, we'll go through the, we'll just say the number of people. Lee Braver, tough book, but actually quite readable, I think. Um, just, that's a hard book, but you'll get through it. Um, it hurts me more than her channel. Um, anyway, this is a study of Wittgenstein and Heidegger, but really what it is, is a very useful book for you to sort of figure out what it really means to talk about a groundless ground, which you should actually have a sense of at the moment, however dim it might be. Um, Deleuze, of the Deleuzian move, you've heard a lot of things about Deleuze um, and Deleuze and Guattari. Uh, 
the thing about Deleuze that's important for us in this course um, is, is the way in which he rethinks how a fold actually becomes a, a, a marker for how something can happen. Now, sadly, I don't have the fold here, which is a work that he wrote called The Fold. Um, it's just too much for, I mean, we could spend an entire course on that one book, The Fold. But as a result, so as a result, I took The Logic of Sense, which is also a very complicated book, but it allows you to understand how smell and tactility come, become part of the logic of something, the logic of rational grounding. So we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, Deleuze and Guattari, uh, they work as a team, as you know, um, and, um, D uh, and Guattari uh, came out and Deleuze uh, did not. And there's always a very interesting sort of prison between them which people don't really write about or talk about, but anyway. So in A Thousand Plateaus, we will pretty much be looking at just the work on the rhizome and this thing called the refrain. refrain. There's another aspect called body without organs. Anybody ever heard of that, body without organs? It seems like the only thing people teach. You know. So anyway, that's the one thing that we're really not going to get into that much because like, it's been you know, taught to death. But, but if you want to hear about it, we can get into it like sideways. Uh, I want you to get the the tools down so that you can then see whether or not you're being taken for a ride or not. So the tool is to understand the relationship between how a refrain operates and how um, a, 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 a plane of imminence operates. So a refrain is like a chorus. Like, I don't know, there's some chorus, and then you have like next line, and you have a chorus, and you have next line, and you have a chorus. That's the refrain is the chorus. And how the chorus operates to create something uh, in relation to the, the sort of the text that follows. It'll make more sense. Is that not making, am I going too fast? Going too fast? Well, I sort of sat in the last chair, so. I know some of the words. Okay. <laughs> well, just do something other than very silent, really. Yeah. Um, so I know that you're still with me. Um, okay. You should look at uh, Einstein, like actually read Einstein. He's very readable, believe it or not, uh, unlike most of the other people. And um, the one thing I didn't put in here, but you could read, because God knows you don't have enough, um, is uh, Spooky at a Distance. If you just if you just Google spooky at a distance, you will see how Einstein tries to understand a very odd phenomena that we will get into. Question? No, just scratch it. Okay. <coughs> On the Foucault front, um, this is a question of how, what identity, what is identity? That's what he's getting into here, and part of the course will be dealing with that. Um, what is the science of the self? Why call it a science? Why call it a self? So he's gonna, we're going to look at that a little bit. I also thought the book Abnormal has not had enough play. And since, there's, uh, since this is a core course for um, queer studies, who um, a lot of students do identify um, with being abnormal, right? I mean, in the best sense. Um, that I thought that you should see how Foucault plays around in this wonderful series of uh, discussions, a lecture series. It's, we probably won't really get into it too much, but I just want to put it on there. The other one that's quite good is Herculean Barbin. I didn't put him, them, him, down, or him her down either. Herculean, H-E-R-C-U-L-I-N-E, -E, Herculean Barbin. I forgot to put that down. Herculean Barbin is a journal, well, it was a person, Named Herculean, uh, Barbine, who was born as a hermaphrodite in France. And in France, apparently there were a lot of hermaphrodites that were born. And so there was a law that was passed that if you happen to be born as a hermaphrodite by the age of, I think, 17, or maybe it was 13, I can't remember, uh, 13 or 17, you were required to choose which gender you were going to be, and then you would live that gender as a, for the rest of your life. Didn't matter whether or not you had um, a vagina or a penis or both that's, you would be able to choose which one you're supposed to do. And Hercule Barbine felt that she was never allowed to choose what she really wanted to be. So she kills herself. But she has a journal that she keeps in, in this is in the 1800s, and, and Foucault found this journal. So it's a very interesting study, actually. Okay, um, 
And on that upbeat note, there's uh, Donna Haraway, When Species Meet. Now, a lot of people, if you've heard of Donna Haraway at all, you've heard about her from um, the simians and some other thing, I forget what it's called. Cyborgs. 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 Manifesto. <laughs> Cyborg Manifesto. She was very early on the digital scene. Um, she's a very interesting um, theorist, philosopher, writer. Uh, then, of course, Heidegger will be a main player, particularly identity and difference. Heidegger is sort of the big hitter here, not because it's Heidegger, although possibly, but mainly because Heidegger is coming up with a whole different system. And I do think that his identity and difference lectures will help you understand that system. Kind of really hot. Um, next. The question concerning technology and other essays, well, you just need to look at the question concerning technology. And what's even more uh, readable is the introduction by William Lovett. So if you get the question concerning technology and you don't get the William Lovett translation, although that one's the one in, in Dropbox, take it back. The William Lovett thing is that he has a very good uh, take on how to read Heidegger. Uh, then I figured a little bit of Homer never killed anyone. So uh, we're going to read King, King Nestor Remembers, which is book three. Um, and it turns out it's quite a famous book in book three. I had no idea. I just found it interesting, so I used to like to play around with it. But it turns out a lot of people find it interesting. Anyway, and I hopefully you will too. Because one of the things that's behind the question of identity is the question of memory. And what can you remember? This is particularly the case, I'm finding the case, because my father outlaws, I call him, he has Alzheimer's right now, and it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse, which is one of his ways to sell a house to help pay for his care. And the question of who is my father, or in this case my father outlaw, changes with the fact that he can't remember. He can remember certain things, but even that is becoming not rememberable, and it's, it's a shocking thing to watch. But it makes one realize just the degree to which the way in which memory is established is important. And the thing about King Nestor is that, as I might, might have mentioned before in last year, if you were in that class, King Nestor uh, makes up a story of, of this, this uh, uh, Thrasymachus comes and he wants to know how his father died in battle. And King Nestor can't remember the father and can't remember whether or not he knew him or if he died or if he was here. So he makes up this whole elaborate story about how fabulous the father was. And um, Thrasymachus goes away really happy. And so the question is, was it... What, what's, what was just being constructed there? What was the memory that was constructed? Not so much, I mean, who cared whether I was right or wrong. This question was like, what actually happens there when you're told a story that helps you do something with your own identity, whatever that story is. So, I mean, <clears throat> not that it has anything to do with today. Um, discussions. Okay, then we have Irigare. I love this book. I mean, I think, um, well, like, put me onto this book, but I think, Matia, you were the one that really loved it, and that's why I kept it on here. Do you still love it? Yeah. Now. Uh, I, no, 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 it's, it's quite interesting, yes. I did my book review in the Master many years ago. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's a good take on Heidegger, undermining it and pushing it to, to, the, to the extreme as if it's still old. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, discourse figure. Now, Jean-Francois Jean Leotard is another big player in this... Um, course. Uh, what he's doing is he is thinking about how something that seems uh, unconnected, how it is connected, and that connection he would call an economy. How it creates an economy. And the economy, then he says the economy operates like a band, a gastral band, or a libidinal band, or a mobus strip, where things spin and so on. So he gets very colorful, like I said, at the tensor is one of the important things. And Discourse Figure is, I think it's his last book that he wrote um, before he died. Um, and that came out just uh, two years ago in English. Um, and basically he takes the notion of discourse, which is what is the general term, this rhizomatic discursive way of posing things, and he, he thinks about it in terms of representation. So that's why we have it on there. It might, might be just one step too far because it's a tough book to read. The tensor is much more um, interesting in that sense. Well, uh, it, I'd like, if I can, in, in this configure, there is a fantastic interim chapter called uh, The Fragment from the History of Desire, 
which analyzes uh, visual culture in the West. In oh, Europe. right. Um, going from uh, medieval paint, drawing, painting, and text kept together, and to the passage of the Renaissance, and to the presentation of space in painting, um, and the, the, the machine of Dürer for, present, for, the, for perspective, and all these things, which is very interesting to read because it really describes how the image of the image develops yeah. in the West. The image of the image, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. And so he wants to cull that back a little bit because he wants to have image. He wants to talk about figures. He wants to talk about how it operates. And he finds that he's been robbed of that in the way in which it's, it unfolds. So this is why that book's an interesting book for us. Um, Gödel's Proof, which is that little blue book that was wandering around the table somewhere. I don't know what's happened to it. Oh, right, there it is. Um, Gödel uh, was a Kurt Gödel, K-U-R-T, uh, discovered or realized that every system is um, constituted by its uncertainty. That every single system, ha any system, no matter how obvious it is, no matter how simple it is, always is uh, constructed by either what they call an undecidability or an uncertainty, what we were calling last term a doubt. And, uh, and he proves this in math simple mathematics, but it becomes the most revolutionary thing in the 20, 20th century, which is kind of a big thing to say. It might even trump relativity theory. This this one notion of the fact that there's this uncertainty making a face. <laughs> I don't think that's true. <laughs> but a lot of people do. Okay, um, anyway, so um, so if you can't understand what Gödel is saying, then you can at least give a go with um, the uh, James uh, Newman and Ernest Nagel's book. Though they do dedicate it to uh, Bertrand Russell, which I think is kind of hilarious. <laughs> Okay, sorry, that's an insider joke. Um, then, Eke Homo, how one becomes one, what one is. This is a very core aspect of this course. How do you invent yourself? Not discover who you are, but how does it get invented? And what is that invention about? That's sort of the underbelly of this course as well. Uh, George Macunius, um, The Manifesto, Fluxus. Anybody ever heard of Fluxus? Lithuanian actually, so it's Machunas. What's that? It's Lithuanian, so it's Machunas. Oh, Machunas, thank you. Thank you. Mm. Well, that explains a lot of things. Then. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great, okay. John Mowat, um, he wrote The Gold Bug. He's actually at Leeds. I'm thinking of trying to bring him down here. He's fantastic. Uh, a lot of fun and very, very brilliant uh, writer. He wrote the foreword to the Discourse Figure, and what he basically is arguing in that Gold Bug is that he's saying he doesn't want to call a new system, so he calls it the gold bug, which I think is totally hilarious, in this one level. And he's basically making an argument that after the dialectic, what do you have? And he's talking about how you take these nonlinear, inco incoherent, discontinuous things, and it creates a system. It's just a not, it's a kind of an ana system, or not really a system. Anytime you want to jump in there, Matia. <laughs> it's always bad. He's sitting right across from me. You can't see him. He's always making faces. <laughs> okay. Um, Nietzsche, genealogy of morals. Anyway, um, uh, well, the Eke Homo, uh, the Kaufman translation for Eke, for genealogy of, for, for sorry for Eke Homo, for untimely meditations, the uh, translating uh, the translators of Ho well basically Hollandale. Between the two, the major translators of Nietzsche, there's Hollandale and, and Kaufman, there's others, but those are the two big ones. Hollandale is, if you want to get to the poetic, sensual, rough, sort of slutty side of Nietzsche, you read Hollandale. And if you want to get to this precise, <coughs> rational, everything is detailed and thought through uh, very carefully, you read Kaufman. And the two of them hate each other. You know, because they think the other one has ruined Nietzsche. And, you know, since they've spent their entire lives translating Nietzsche, you can imagine how serious this argument is. Um, and what I didn't put on here, but you might want to go check out, is called uh, My Sister and I, which was um, found, it was discovered um, about 60 years ago. And it's supposed to be the real version of Eke Homo. And um, it's basically Nietzsche as an SM um, bottom. Basically, and he's got all these pictures of his sister dressed up in whips and chaining and, and 
hitting him with a, a chair or something, you know, like a, you know, whatever. And so Kaufman had a complete nervous breakdown when he saw this. And, and what's really interesting about the book is not, of course, what Nietzsche wrote, because who knows whether or not he really wrote this. But actually what's interesting is the 100-page preface that goes before it, where they argue about whether or not it's real. Whether or not this is, and did they have the right to show this? And, and this embarrassed the sister, and the sister, and this couldn't, you know, it was like early Photoshop or something, if, if she really wasn't dressed in the sphere. Yeah, so it's it's fascinating, and that's um, that's worth taking a look at because it really just <coughs> asks the question, what's really true here, and it doesn't matter what happened. Yeah. Do we try and get a PDF? That, that's yeah, yeah. It's really possible to get. In the oh really? Copy. <laughs> it's probably an important junction. I have a copy at home. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sure we can get a PDF if I can't find it. Yeah. Did you want to say? No. Right. Okay. Um, then we have. Uh, Oh, um, Benjamin Noyes, N-O-Y-S. I want to bring him here to talk. He is, he is the true Victor Meldrew of the next generation. <coughs> he is grumpy. He likes to have smoke every five minutes and um, want a beer. And he's incredibly, he's very, very intelligent. And he understands um, how to play with multiplicity. So his are very playful articles and, and books and so on. And his background is Bataille. Um, then there's the um, Rubenstein Golding Fisher book on the Virgin Photography. There's a piece in there by Rubenstein that's important for you to take a look at, which is on the thing. Nina Samuel, she did this work called The Islands of Benio. There should be a little, no, there's a little hat over there. Uh, Mandelbrot, Fractals, Chaos, and the Materiality of Thinking. And I didn't put a publisher, I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, it's a very good book on the notion of fractals, which we'll get into, which will be another important core to this course. Uh, there is Isabel Stengers, who we will get to meet, which is kind of exciting. Uh, thinking of Whitehead, a free wild creation of concepts, uh, and also her cosmopolitics, which will just be selections. Uh, Douglas Stone, I just came across this book, I haven't read it fully, so I, it's, a, it's a gamble, um, it's a punt, I'm not sure if it's good, but it looked good, the title was good, Einstein and the Quantum, the Quest for the, of the Valiant Swabian, but yeah, I'm there, you know, um, you looked at it a little bit, what do you think of it? Uh, it's very readable. It's, it's, it's very readable. Yeah, it's oh my very, god. Yeah. Oh, that way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a good, it's a good book for the holiday, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so it's sad. Okay, Alan, uh, Alan Turing, uh, Can Machines Think? That's a very famous piece. Um, his, his whole argument was, we haven't figured out computing until we, until you can ask a machine, do you want ice cream with a cherry on top? And the machine, quote, understands. And doesn't just process the argument, the, the understanding. Now, of course, we do have understanding. It's, it's called AI, artificial intelligence. And that's, so we'll, of course, we'll end up on, a, on artificial intelligence not to be confused with uh, artificial insemination. So artificial intelligence, okay, AI on that side. Different toilet version. Okay, and uh, the Format Brothers, I showed you a, a clip last uh, uh, term about this, but we'll take another look at it later in this uh, semester. Um, and then finally, Wittgenstein Remarks on Color. Now, let me just go back to the actual course. As I mentioned the, the, the images on the cover here. This is from Mandelbrot. This is when he starts playing around, and he realized you could actually start doing things that would create 2D, 3D on a computer screen. And when you think about at the time, they compared like how to do these kind of things. It was all very new. Um, and uh, he started to realize that um, programming would go a lot farther if people did not think in terms of yes, go this way, no, go that way. That would be programming. But you start thinking algorithmic um, fractals. So you start thinking about how something did feedback loops, and how the feedback loops would then add something that you couldn't really add. And from that has developed data, data mining and metadata and so on. Uh, in fact, as someone who ran out of the room, Lee, I might come back, um, his PhD um, is in part about uh, the fact that metadata is, while we hear a lot of bad things about it in terms of how the, you know, spy services are using it. Um, it's actually, his part of his argument is that it's very useful for artists because that's been artist data mine. And so to actually have uh, an entire computing environment that operates a system on data mining 
is what he's developing as method, which is kind of interesting. It's a whole different. You didn't hear that from here. They will be very upset. No, it's, it, a lot of people work on data mining on that level, but that's what's coming from. Okay, so it's about flow, it's about energy, it's about fluxes, about dimensions. The so time comes in, space comes in, belonging comes in, identity comes in. These are things that we're going to be playing with here. Um, words like skin, like corpus, like singularity, like multiplicity, these will feature uh, in the course. Um, so, I have here, you are welcome indeed, you are encouraged to inhabit untimely meds by your own practice-based artwork. That is essential here. I don't think I emphasized that a lot last term, although it is difficult to do both. I recognize that. But if you can at all feel that you can do your artwork as an not not just an expression, but saying the same thing that you're doing in the in the in your readings, that would be good because you'll be able to see it, you'll be able to feel it better. Um, so be whether or not you're working electronically, digitally, with oil, with clay, with acrylics, disembodiment, literary, augmented, dimensional, synthetic, bio, compositional memory voice, imagining corporeal, immaterial, photographic, libidinal, incomplete, intense. Entangled, gestural, a dirty rotten, you know, blood colitis I was losing. I was trying to figure out what else to put, or something else altogether. So, that's basically what's going to be involved now. Is is Dane here? Because he's not here in the business. Okay. So, <coughs> Matia, there's Matia. We all know Matia. Matia is now formally, as is Dane, formally the um, tutor for the class, and um, and he's going to also sometimes give lectures. But mainly, he's back there, and he's uh, there to um, help field any of your questions on uh, whatever might be coming up as a, as a mind and as is um, Dane. Um, so we know that there's a two-hour-plus lecture seminar. I'm going to try and do it in such a way that we have more talking from the crowd, less talking from me. Um, but we'll see how we go. So there's an analytic book review, the famous book review. Um, Pick something out of one of the um, books that I've listed. And if there isn't one on the list that you really want to do, you're welcome to do that. But I always think you know, use your time wisely. So if it helps you to understand the core of the course, then do identity and difference. If you, were, if you really want to understand how the core is operating, then do the Heidegger. If you want to understand something further down the line of the core, then you do the quantum stuff. Because what I'm asking you to do is to think plurally, is to think in technicolor, as I keep saying. You do that anyway, but I'm just trying to get you to realize how to do it so that you don't have to be walking around and, and have an epiphany. You, you could be walking around and have it told to you so you can work with it. Um, that's part of the background there. Um, I don't know when the deadline is for the uh, artwork, for the essay. That's why I said do it in the term. Sorry. Um, no one told me anything and I didn't want to put down the wrong date like I've done before, so this time I've put down a marker. Do when you're supposed to have it handed in. That's what that means. Um, and, uh, you know, if you can't hand something in for some reason, you simply don't wait till after the deadline. Let us know. We can, we can always make arrangements, we can always deal with it, that kind of thing. Okay, any questions so far? Exhausted, feel good. No? Okay. No questions. Okay. I'm going to be too silent. Okay, now. Uh, if you go to then, we'll just continue, I'll continue the waking you. Um, now, these readings are important. They're not essential. They kind of are good if you're, if you should keep these in case you want to ever write a dissertation. You'll have like a, you know, kind of good bibliography. Um, one of my favorite ones is um, Pussy King of the Pirates, but as that really isn't, that again is one of these uh, books that is written in a very Delusian style. If you get a hold of it and you read it, you'll see what I mean. I'm not going to get into it right now. Very interesting work. Um, it was, it obviously, the booksellers didn't know if they should put it in the window um, because of the P word, pirates. Mostly. Um, anyway, uh, and uh, so that's also very interesting, just how, how censorship works, when it works, when it doesn't work, 
um, you know, that kind of thing. Like, uh, for example, they're trying to censor the image of a woman breastfeeding. Like, really? <laughs> it's just like, you know, women have to sit on a, behind a, a tree or something in the shopping mall. Okay, um, so then the, the other one that's really quite an interesting book is called, um, by an Anonymous, 14th Century, The Cloud of Unknowing. Has anybody ever heard of this? Oh, good. What do you think of it? What do you make of it? It's a long time ago, so I've looked at it, but I think I was quite impressed. <laughs> it's, 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 it's written by thought. supposedly a monk. Nobody really knows if the monk was a it monk. Was or this, woman, sorry? There's some, whether I've read somewhere or something in my head, is that sort of what, a biographical thing that um, he, she, it may have come from Warwickshire, from ah, the Midlands. That's hilarious, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, I didn't mean to laugh that. We all make things up, don't we? No, it's great. No, that's funny. I mean, that's not funny. Um, it's, good to be, it's good to make jokes. That is true. Uh, the Cloud of Unknowing is a really wonderful meditation. Um, it's written by someone who is religious, but who is um, he basically doesn't believe in the kind of religion of the day. Now, this is written in the 14th century. That's just fascinating, you know, when you think about it. And, and everybody says, oh, everything's being medieval. Well, if the medieval time period was like this, this is very interesting. It's like there's like a cartoon version of the medieval time period, which is happening now. And then there was actually the medieval time period, which is a little bit more interesting. Anyway, this anonymous, uh, the cloud of unknowing, is very interesting work. It's uh, the, the the person writing, or maybe it's multiple people writing, mm -hmm. have this notion of the cloud, um, and it's um, and the cloud is not. So God is God is the cloud, basically, but God doesn't know everything. God knows is just an unknowing. And it gets into this whole thing about how one has to reach the state of unknowingness. <clears throat> and now it's not Zen, it's not like a Buddhist thing, it's it's just a very peculiar and interesting take on God. It's like the negative dialectic version of God. You can, go, you can stretch that far. Okay, so I, it's, it's quite an interesting uh, move. Um, Karen Barad, uh, Meeting the Universe Halfway, Quantum Physics and the Entanglement of Matter and Meaning. I've actually got her, moved her to important readings, but in fact we're doing part of the uh, work is going to be on hers. Is she writes very, she's a lovely, wonderful writer, but she's a bit dry on this particular section, though very readable. So, uh, anyway. Uh, the Bohr-Einstein Debates, they're useful. The Chaos, Fractals, and Dynamics, Part 1 is a video link, which obviously doesn't seem to have hyperlinked on this. Uh, the tiny URL, so sorry about that. I'll have to uh, get that link to you. Uh, the Arcades Project by Benjamin. Uh, unpacking my library, the storyteller. Benjamin was one of the first people that started thinking outside of dialectics while maintaining inside dialectics. I'll go back to that. Gregory Chaitin, thinking about Google and Turing, essays on complexity. Very helpful if you don't know where you're going with the stuff on this notion of complexity. Delanda, Intensive Science and Virtual Philosophy, um, A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History. He's a very, um, what I call, um, shoot him up, bang, bang kind of um, philosopher. He comes in a room, bang, 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 and, and he makes a position and leaves. Okay, um, and sometimes he's really interesting and sometimes he's not very, he just causes a lot of trouble. Uh, but he's, he's worth knowing who he is and what he's about. Uh, Deleuze, the new cartographer, is, this is what most people read when they're reading Foucault for the first time. That or uh, Discipline and Punish, I think is the other one. Um, I think the order of things would not go in this either, but um, so you can put that down. Uh, what is philosophy is um, part of the De Deleuzean move. It's very different than the what is philosophy um, of the work that we're going to take a look at in a, in a moment. In a second. But anyway. Um, Duchamp. Duchamp would probably be another core artist that sort of underwrites, um, I guess, this course. Uh, Foucault's Technologies of the Self, um, and then pretty much everything I could think of with Foucault, Care of the Self, really important. But only if you become obsessed with Foucault. That's why he's on the secondary li list, not this bit, not because he's not important here. Uh, the Ninth Technology of Otherness, um, I've written that. It's a very complex uh, argument in, in, uh, of Foucault's work on the courage of truth and about 
what it means to have an ethical move sexually. What's the sexual ethical move? And how one has a debt that they pay. Um, then there is um, animaturialism and the opinion lies, just bringing in the notion of animaturialism, fractal philosophy, which you've seen. Um, Guattari did chiasmosis, an ethico aesthetic paradigm. Heidegger, contributions to philosophy of the event, you know, another unreadable but very important work. What is called thinking? Uh, I debated about putting that uh, in the optional category and then decided note to self, put an optional. I see I forgot to erase optional. Hofstetter, very good, very interesting work. Good old Escher Fox. Some people live by that book. It's been important for people to set them on their path for this kind of a timing next, but I figured you'd get on your own path and then you could come to him if you wanted. Um, <coughs> Lucy Lippard. Lucy Lippard, such a wonderful, wonderful title. Six Years, The Dematerialization of the Art Object from 1966 to 1972, a cross-reference book on some ethnic boundaries consisting of a biography into which are inserted a fragmented text, artwork, interviews, and symposia arranged chronologically and focused on so-called conceptual or information or idea art with mentions of such vaguely designated areas as minimal anti-form systems, earth, or process art occurring now in the Americas, Europe, England, Africa, and Asia with occasional political overtones. Fantastic. She was in late 66. No, it's like, it's like the more things change, the more things remain the same. Um, I don't know how she got this published. Uh, it is fantastic then. And probably any author, any publisher that saw it now would just go, really? You know, with first of all, the title's too long. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, clue. Uh, but it's fantastic. And it's a fantastic work. And you really have to take a look at it in some way. Probably I should have put on the main list, not the back list. Um, Jean-Francois Lyotard, The Assassination of Experience by Painting. I think the title is more suggestive than the actual book. I'm sick to say this. I love the title. I stole it. I stole a version of it, Assassination of Time. That's how much I loved it. Um, but he, it's a, what he basically is saying is that, um, is that, you know, witnessing and the way in which one can witness through a photograph, the way in which photographs are shown as a form of witnessing, he's basically saying that that is an experience that needs to be gotten rid of. And that painting will allow the um, ability to witness and experience, it, it allows it to kill it. So he looks at Monterey, who's always producing these like experiential paintings in monochrome, and he's basically showing how the experience is actually a non-experience, an Anna experience, sort of elsewhere experience. So it's not uninteresting. Uh, in fact, it's important. But anyway. Then there's Stephen Shaviro. Um, oh, I forgot. Lessons of the Analytic of the Spline. Very complicated, unless you have a Kantian um, uh, bug in your, um, somewhere, an uh, itch somewhere, then you, I would stay away from this, unless you want to go Kant. Um, which, it, it's a great book. I mean, I love this book. It's very, very intense. Um, it's on the question of the Sublime, obviously. Stephen Shaviro, Without Criteria, Kant, Whitehead, Deleuze, and Aesthetics. This is a useful book to understand uh, Stenger's, but Stenger's is very understandable, so I just put him in as, as a kind of shorthand if you want it. Uh, Wittgenstein, oh sorry, the Format Brothers, I put him in again here. Uh, Wittgenstein, Lectures on the Foundations of Mathematics. I couldn't decide which, it, because I could go there, I could go in the front, but we've got the Remarks on Colors, which is a book that very few people read, so I figured that should go in the front. Any questions on this bit? I agree. All right. Now, a question. Well, not a question. It's a, another one of these. Yes. Anybody here? Pass. Anybody else need them? Oh, yes. Let me just pass along to you. Also, I sent them, I think, to most of you. And also, Sue Rice was meant to send them around, but I don't know if she did. Did she? Yeah. 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 No. Nope. Oh, there is, is that? Oh, wait, oh, that's just paper. Uh, <laughs> sorry. You, did you not get any? Who doesn't have one? Uh, can you look on? Yeah. Both ways, and then I'll print off uh, at the end of the puzzle. Okay. Okay. Um, who doesn't have one? We have three people that still need them? Or something? It's okay. I'll print one off. 
Same. Okay. All right. Um, part one. I noticed when I was doing this, I don't think I put part two and part three in here. And so I do apologize. I don't think I put it to one. Oh, no, I do have part two in here. Oh, um, and uh, part three is like one mm -hmm. at a time. Okay, um, now, there is a debate as to how long is a course. We always have this debate. Uh, I don't think you can actually understand what the course is doing if you have less than 15 weeks, but that's just me. And we all have less than 15 weeks, so it doesn't really matter. So I have now tried to put in secretly 11, 12 weeks. And I don't know if that goes into the vacation or not. So we'll try and work around that. Um, I didn't have the calendar in front of me, and I do apologize about that. And I also wanted to take us to see Isabel Stenders. So to me, that was an important thing to do. Do you agree? Because otherwise, we can just move everything up one. Do you want to go to Isabel Stenders? Yeah. Okay, don't speak at once. Okay, good. <laughs> I, I think I'm praying to Lord Howe. Oh, you are from New York, aren't you? <laughs> you just get this sense that they like to pee on things, you know? Um, okay, sorry, Lord. Okay, um, part one is basically getting you to understand the famous ground problem. Except this time, without a ground. So it gets really weird. And uh, what I was going to do today is to give you a sense of <coughs> weirdness. Now, I have a number of things that none of you have read and you didn't get this until today. Um, so at some point in the week, if you can catch up with yourself, and read uh, at least read um, the Why Am I So Wise, which is like three, cent three pages long. The uh, King Nestor Remembers is again, not that long, it's maybe four pages long. And the uh, Fluxious Manifesto is right there. Um, then you can check out the work of Joseph Boys, uh, Dieter Roth, pardon me, Nat Jim Peck, um, if you want. And the only one you haven't probably read is Benjamin Noyes' uh, The Discreet Charm of Bruno Latour. But I'm gonna go through this in a minute. Um, so the very first, what we're gonna do tonight, so we finish going through this uh, moment here, is I want to just give you a sense of the ground and the and what happens when you don't have one, what that's about. And hopefully this will begin to make a little bit more sense. Week two. Hey, I'm falling. Where's the ground? Okay. So this is really to get you into thinking about this notion of deterritorialization, nomadic thinking, as um, Foucault and Deleuze and Guattari started calling it. They started calling this uh, a way to combat fascism. And so uh, one of the things to read is an introduction to the non-fascist life, um, which is like 10 points. It's not very long. Um, the next thing is to read is the question concerning the technology. That will be. So between today's lecture and next week's lecture, you should have caught up because there's not a lot of reading. It looks like a lot, but it's actually not. Week three we get into this question of genealogy, which is the Nietzschean move, archaeology, which is the Foucauldian move, then he kind of shifts it over to discourse analysis, and then we kind of are caught back up with the Deleuzian um, move around uh, surfaces and Wittgenstein's notion of surface and so on. Um, and always remember that every seminar has a kind of title to it. I don't believe in untitled. Sorry, I'm passionate that way. I have titles. Here they are. They help you understand what's going to be said. They help. They give you a bit of a direction of where we're going with it. If you haven't got it from the title, then you look at seminar considerations. There's a, the next unfolding clue. Here's where we're going to go drilling deeper into it. This is where we're going with this. Uh, week four is what is it? What does it mean to belong? and how belonging sets up an identity. And it's a very famous move by Heidegger where he starts talking about A equals A. And it really, at some point, you just feel like knife in the head. I mean, it's like, okay, 
because he says, and here's the thing about identity, it is A equals A, and everybody's like, yes, yes. Yeah. So we're going to go through and understand why A equals A is like something profound, because it actually turns out to be quite profound. Um, so, and it has to do with something around solitude. It has to do with wandering, and it has to do with dwelling. And the word dwelling in, in particular brings up the notion of land and landscape. And in fact, when you think about it, the notion of ground kind of brings up land. So when you feel grounded, it's like you got your feet on this thing, otherwise known as the ground. So there's a relation between the earth, or what uh, Stengers is going to into Gaia, the earth, the ground, landscape, and knowing how to feel, and, and from that, knowing how to think. So it's not the other way around. Um, Okay, so um, and so you look at Heidegger, and you will look at the thing on identity, and then um, on February seventh, no, tenth, sorry. Um, then it is what does it mean to belong? So the first belonging is what does it mean to gather together, to be drawn together, and the next one is what does it mean to stay apart? So gather. Oh, how 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 is it that identity? allows for this kind of fluxus, or this flexibility, where you're drawn together, but you're also having to be apart. So it's together and apart at the same time. And that's the first move. That's the first move when you start realizing that it's together and it's apart at the same time. And that's where we start moving to a very different notion of um, space dwelling, because you're together and apart at the same time. OK. Then we get into part two. Oh, I said, yeah, what is philosophy in Braver? It's one of the early chapters in his uh, Groundless Grounds book. Uh, and that's where he sets out the problem, in case it's not clear at this point. You turn to, you turn to this. Part two, what does it mean then to talk about difference? So if we have identity, then what does it mean to be different? Or difference, for sure. Multiplicity and events. So you get into, we're going to get into these variations. You see that the book review is due six weeks into the course. Now, I didn't want you to not go to the Isabel Stenger's thing, so I put it on Friday as a review date being handed in, as opposed to on the Tuesday. Okay? Um, okay, so, uh, and we'll all figure out how to get up there. It should be fun. And if nothing else, we'll just, we'll go see the Nottingham Contemporary together and see what it's like. I mean, I've never been there, have you? Good. Yeah, I think it, I think it will be good, and they're very much looking forward to seeing us, which is really nice. I called them up very stern. Yes, let's roll down. Yes, <laughs> I have students who want to see this wonderful person. And they're like, hey, where are you from? We're from Birmingham, but we could be from all over. <laughs> anyway, um, okay. So the first thing around difference is how does difference make something become different? So one is how something the same, and the next is getting into the difference. So it gets into appropriations and duration and and these longer things. These, the duration is, you know, when you think of like, ah, that's, dur that's a durational move. Like, how long is that? Ah, how long did that go? Well, you can time it and say, well, it's three seconds. But timing wouldn't tell you anything about that durational move. So it gets into these kind of questions. It probably hopefully doesn't not sound quite as esoteric as that. Um, then we get into how difference makes patterns and how that becomes interesting, not because the patterns look alike, but because the patterns can look different. So when you think about camouflage, for example, which is based on patterns, but the patterns are all squiggly different patterns, and yet one understands it as a pattern. It is a pattern of nothing that matches. So we'll get into why that's important, and we get into this thing called Roku Gaku, my favorite thing because I mean I don't how many people in the room can speak Japanese? How many people speak Japanese or Chinese? Um, okay, well Roku Gaku was invented by the Format brothers because they were so sick of postmodernism and the term and it being so typically Western um, and it always drew in the same people that they decided to call this move that they're doing around sound, acoustic philosophy, this is what's behind this course, Roku Gaku. And I think it's great, <laughs> so I use it as much as possible. Hasn't really caught on, but maybe it will. Um, just so you know. Okay, so 
Um, right, and then, then we get with the Rokugaku gets into libidinal economies, which hopefully will become more clear. Um, then the ninth week is from the tensor band. We get into this notion of the tensor band. So um, eight, nine. Okay, yeah. So week eight, it's basically so difference makes a difference. It, it shows how tension and intensity become part of the problem of the problem in the sense of the solution of understanding difference. And then you move from the tensor band to the question of relativity, which might seem like a big leap, but actually it's not. You'll see by the time we get there, it'll, it'll just be like a walk in the park. And, go, yeah, whatever. Um, and you'll, you'll get a sense of how the, the sexualities come into this notion of relativity, how the questions of the bodies come in, drives, and so on. So hopefully that comes in here. Um, and, and it, I mean, Kurt Gödel might have a bit heart attack to know that he's in this section um, because he's really died in the wool mathematician. <laughs> anyway, there he is. Um, yeah. So, and we'll, there's Isabel Sten Stenger's um, thinking with whitehood, the adventures of the senses, and also feeling one's world. Both are very interesting for this. Um, okay, and then the. Week 10, which is technically, I think, the end of the... Does anybody know when the semester ends, when the term ends? Does it end on the 18th or does it end the following week? Following week. Good. Because I was hoping it ended the following two weeks, because I have two more sessions. Okay, so we have week 10 on the 18th, uh, which is we get into this question. We're now we're going to start getting into the real questions around quanta. Quanta, in case you don't know, means light. Uh, you know, kind of an interesting... Um, different way of talking about light. So a quanta is a measurable unit of light. Okay, now, and then we get into um, week 11, which is the uh, time-space image, and we get into the whole question of quantum physics and black holes, and we really start going quite wild. And hopefully, there are no more classes. Um, I wasn't sure if week 12 was a class. That says, I should say week 12, April 3rd. That, I put that blank there because I wasn't sure whether or not we had one or not. But if we don't have one, obviously it's blank. But if we do, then we can just push it out. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so, well, the book review is due. It says Friday, 27th of February, 2014. Uh, that's 2015. So, Friday, the 23rd is a Monday. Is it? Oh, then I added one. I'm so Are you sure? Yeah. I've got my diary there. Can you? Well, then what's the so 17th? The next lecture. But well, the 17th is a, is a, the 17th is a, is a Tuesday. Tuesday. And that, the 18th that is Friday. a Wednesday. Yeah. And then that Friday. The 19th is, is a, yeah. Friday is the 20th. Friday is the 20th. It's the 20th, it's due. So then the Friday. Unless you want the Monday. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're welcome to hand it on Friday or the Monday. <coughs> I won't be here on that Monday. I won't be here on the Friday either. Um, but anyway, um, and don't hand them into the office. Just put them in the kitchen hall. And if you can email me, thank you for finding that evil eye. Well done. <laughs> yeah. What's the Monday? Twenty-third is a Monday, and the twentieth is a Friday. Monday is. What's that? Monday is. Monday? It is. <laughs> for <Yeah. having> it. <laughs> okay, we're going to take a little break, get some air in the room, because then we're going to have a proper lecture. Okay, unless you have any other questions. No? Okay. Okay, what I'd like you to do, uh, if you don't mind, is to introduce yourselves, because now we're starting again. We're pretending like, you know, the first hour and a half meant nothing. Uh, and we're just going to go around, if you can say your name or the name you want to go by in the class, or whatever. Um, and also what you are working on right now, or what you hope to be working on right now. So are we going to do Sue? No. Uh, I'm Sue. Does everybody know Sue? Yeah. Does everybody know Sue's name? Sue knows. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit of a trick question. That's right, that's right. Um, I do installation work with reclaimed objects, and at the moment I'm working with bottles and glass. And what do you do with them? Uh, good question. <laughs> That's where we are at the moment with it. Um, uh, I'm just sort of experimenting and thinking. You, I want to make an installation eventually. But do you know uh, Do you know Ben Woodinson's work? W O D E N S O N. Ben. 
He works with the plain glass. O O D E N S O M. The thing about Ben is that his work, hi Ben, uh, is very severe. So he's always uh, throwing the glass and oh, making right. it break. It, like he'll have a huge shard of glass that could be ready to fall over. And I don't know how he passes health, health, health and safety things, but he's someone to look into. That's, that's All right, well, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah. Everyone know this Sarah? Okay. You <laughs> ran into her in a, in, a, in a corner store. You know her name is Sarah. We're now halfway through, so that's good. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, I um, am working, I guess, with the notion of autobiography. Um, and this particular um, term is completely up my street, so I'm really happy about that. Are you still working on Jung? No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Jung is lovely. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think he'll always be there underpinning the work, but... So don't feel bad, Carl. <laughs> yeah, I'm okay. not referencing him okay. specifically. Good. Uh, I'm Lucy. Everyone uh, know Lucy? Do you know Lucy uh, if you saw in a dark alley? <laughs> okay, right. Um, uh, I'm looking at... Um, I'm mostly painting, but kind of looking at using water as well. Um, looking at holes in water, floating, sinking, falling and kind of moving into reflections as well. When you say looking at, do you mean... Thinking about. Thinking about, so you're not actually floating. Thinking about floating. Thinking about something. Okay. Within water. Yes, that's good that person. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yes. Okay. Um, do you know the work of, um, oh, what's that artist's name? The, the bodies that float in the tubs. Yes. Whatever. Oh, the Bill Viola. No, I'm thinking of this woman, Rika. Oh, in the um, yes. Okay. Well, anyway, so so when you say looking at, do you mean that you're actually studying them, or do you also produce work? Producing work. Okay. And so, what would an example be? Um, well, I, to, at the moment, they're paintings, but they're kind of um, <laughs> they're. They're to do with water and the use of kind of paint on the surface. I had a discussion today about the sort of residue of water that's left over. Um, but there's a degree of figure in there, but not so much um, not so much that it's necessarily particularly identifiable, but there's a figure in there to do with the water as well, um, that is either sinking or floating in it. Um, and there's a movement towards using a water as a reflective surface um, at the same time as having a painting to sort of have a, um, a conversation with the painting and, and you're thinking about how it works in relation to what you're looking at. Did you know that, uh, which you probably did know, that uh, Da Vinci was totally obsessed with painting the surface of water and in his uh, notebooks he has this long discussion on how you paint the surface of water. Have you ever seen this? It's worth taking a look at. In his other book, <coughs> okay. I'm um, Emily Sparks. Um, sorry, we've got those sorts today. Um, but yeah, I think at the moment I'm getting more kind of hung up on um, Tableau Vivant. Have you ever heard of that? It's like yeah. a Victorian, it was a Victorian parlor game, uh, I think originally, but uh, there's a, people used to get together and pose like paintings and you have to like charades I suppose and you used to get guess what the painting was but um, the Marquis de Sade used it and wrote about it a little bit I think and that was yeah that's a bit sexy. And do you then paint these things or you just or is it mainly a performance? Um, I think it was it, it was it used to be literally a game that they'd play where you'd pose in a painting and you guess what the painting was. Um, but I think that's I don't know it's just just kind of uh, interesting with painting and performance and things like that. So, but so are you way. painting it, or are you doing it with both painting and performance? I don't know what to do with it, because mm -hmm. I, I came across it um, in uh, Time Binds by Elizabeth Freeman, mm -hmm. and I read that, and she talks about it a lot in terms of, uh, you know, her temple of temple dragon and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Oops. That sounds <coughs> wet. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. You sure? Okay. <laughs> so very quiet there. Okay, yes. Um, I'm looking at um, how stripping might 
um, for CUG, subvert gender norms and heteronormative drug dealings. Great. That's different than what you were originally doing. Yeah. What made you change? Well, I just I just kind of like moved through it really because originally I used to do about drug, um, and then like coming into the MA and then getting a job in a strip club, it kind of like opened up the kind of worms. That's the six hour I'm good with it. Um, <laughs> yeah. And are you still on the reception desk? Are you actually stripping? No, I'm still receptionist and host, but I've um, reduced my hours. So in two weeks, I'll be returning to the bar for a little bit. Um, oh, I thought you were going to say you're going to be returning to your old life. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, <coughs> Great. Hi, I'm Andre. I take photographs and then the objects. Uh, on Friday, I'm going to go to the V&A to have a look at an object called a flawed glass. Um, which problematically also is known as a black, as a black mirror. Um, I'm hoping to go to the stores of the Science Museum. They hold a collection of these clawed glasses, and one of them belonged to the, well, he's called the physician of Elizabeth I, but he was actually a, you know, a dark horse um, person. I'm not sure I'm going to get into the, the stores of the Science Museum, but it's a bit short notice, but I'm going to see the one. That, the DNA. What is it? Why is it called a dark mirror as opposed to well, or a black mirror? It, it's it's that's just the physical description. No, of, but what does of, it do? Well, what it does, it was used by painters and tourists. I guess it's a, it's it's been quipped as the kind of Instagram of the 18th century. Um, painters used it to kind of view um, landscapes um, indirectly and kind of. Um, Changes the tonality and the um, um, uh, um, um, uh, anyway, changes the tonality of of a scene and uh, gives it a different kind of way of approaching it. Um, yeah, that's, that's that builds friendship. Great. Um, okay. So that's what they use to kind of make paintings, <coughs> landscape paintings. And why would that? Why would a black mirror be more useful than a, let's say, you know, regular mirror? Or what? What's the difference between a regular? Because the, the, right, I mean, well, I just want you to, for people well, that don't know well, what this so, is. So sorry, the contrast and the tonality. So the a regular mirror would give you almost a, for want of a better description, a one to one, uh, one for one kind of likeness of of the scene, whereas the black mirror would kind of dilute some of the kind of qualities out of it and, and give it a different quality. Uh, but it was also, so this physician of um, Elizabeth I, it was also used as it was, it was scry glass or something. It was, uh, it was used in kind of magic to kind of read the future or whatever. Um, so you sound like you don't believe that. Well, <laughs> totally, I'm buying into it. Buying into it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, my name is Jamal. Um, I'm trying in my drawing. I'm trying to see how to um, become a reflective practitioner. And uh, um, when you say reflective, do you mean literally using reflectiveness, or do you mean? Yeah, it's, it's when I was like researching uh, about when I come across Gray and uh, Sean's uh, theory of uh, reflective practitioner. Mm. I, I, I mean, I really like it that way. So I. It, I I'm trying to make it part of my practice, and it's just about uh, doing work and then push, make for, make formal questions about your work, and then try to construct new meanings from uh, my practice. Okay. Good. Thank you. Can anybody do the names? Sue. Sue, Sarah. Sarah. Lucy. Emily. Hey, Katie. Okay, good. Nula. Nula. <laughs> I make body objects that kind of, ex well, explore my emotionality, physicality, and a shared sensuality. So when you say body object, you mean it looks like a body? Um, parts of my body juxtaposed with found objects. So what would that be? Um, spoons. Which have um, <laughs> parts of mouth, 
uh -huh. um, on them or, okay, or the bits of teeth. Bit um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of mainly been focusing on my mouth, so mm -hmm. casting the inside of my mouth. Do you know the work of uh, Mairead McLean? She's a um, she's now a filmmaker, but it went well. Actually, she moved. She was always a filmmaker, but in one of her films, she specifically it's about the mouth, and she stitches up her mouth. Oh. There's a number of people that are involved with that kind of move, the kind of the, the way in which the stitching of the mouth operates. Yeah. Who else? I'm Franco. Oh yeah, of course. Franco did also his work in the nineties with his mouth. So yeah, yeah, Franco, Franco Black Beast and it was Black is it? Franco something. Yeah, Franco. Franco, Franco, Franco B. B. Yeah. Franco something. Yeah. Franco yeah. B. Yeah. Yeah, the two of them. And Maria. M. Maraid, M. A. I. R. E. A. D. McLean, M. C. C. M. No, M. C. L. E. A. M. She's mainly a um, filmmaker these days. Yeah, good. Thank you, Noah. Um, one more question. Um, I'm interested in um, an attempt to rematerialize the dematerialized object that. Johnny picked out that book six years, that's a real important book to me. And um, I'm trying to continue that theme that I touched on at the end of my MA, which was uh, last year, um, by a project at the moment which is looking into the work of a guy called Reg Butler, and not particularly because it's his work, but he um, was a winner in a competition um, in the 1950s, um, which was it was an international competition um, inviting sculptors to submit a maquette for a monument to an unknown or the unknown political prisoner. It's not that <laughs> you <laughs> also speak about this. Yeah, in, yeah. Okay. So that's my current work, and what what partly interests me is this idea of rematerialised trying to rematerialize objects pretty directly um, facing that kind of problem, this problem that lots many things have been done and lots of art that we look at is derivative and so on. So I'm not saying I have the answer to that, but I'm kind of interested in that and interested in a, a revisiting and a repetition of something that's already been done, particularly around this notion of autonomous art objects. So the, the political prisoner uh, monument is, is, is really interesting because not only was it dematerialised, well, it wasn't because it actually never was made mm. uh, because there were lots of, as I'm finding out, this wasn't my reason for doing it, but there were lots of political reasons why that didn't happen. It's quite a can of worms, that mm. one. So I'm researching that with tape at the moment. And my intention is to... Uh, make this monument not as big as it was intended to be, uh, which was like something like 40 metres. <laughs> do that, but to scale in some sort of modern, you know, contemporary material. Is there some reason apart from money that you wouldn't do 40 metres? Um, um, no, not really. I, I don't know yet. I, 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 have, think about. I could think. I could think about that. Um, the actual making of it would be really cool. But it's a good challenge. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I, I did think about that. Well, impossible. No, so. but sometimes uh, because you know a lot of people they're called architects. Yeah. Tend to make big things that are like forty meters. Yeah. But of course, they're not called <coughs> art objects or homages. Often yeah. they are art objects. But I'm just curious. Is it because it would throw it into some other category is it because it'd be so invasive that it would be something else is it you know is it because it's just impossible monetarily you know well, what what is the argument i'd have to think about what i could yeah. make it from and i want to make it myself yeah that is quite important so the self making is important, is, is important. Does, do other people share that in your art that it, it, there's, it has to be your your own as it were i don't know that, i wouldn't say necessarily that's that's like you know always the case but for me thing. and where i'm at in my practice at the moment I think it is, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. And can you just explain your maquette here? That's the maquette from a large piece of sculpture that I um, um, repeated by Barbara Hepworth um, last 
at the end of the, the end of the year, and it's a, a 1966 piece of sculpture called Four Square Walkthrough that she made, um, and there are three of them, and they are quite a bit higher than that hall out there. Um, and I made one to scale three quarter size with this sort of idea of repeating. So scale is also important. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Scale, individuality, and materials. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hello. 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 Um, I'm a community music practitioner, um, and I'm kind of interested in how music like generates community spirit um, and how it affects like mental health and well-being and stuff. Um, mm. I'm currently kind of for my dissertation looking into a discussion, like an ethical discussion, on how communities developed um, and established. So there's the organic way of developing community through music, but then there's like a manufactured way through marketing, and I want to kind of look into the, the ethics of that. There's a new that. book that's just come out by a guy named Steve Kennedy, okay. and it's called Sonic Economies. And what he does is he looks at Detroit and Coventry, because they had two things in common. Detroit One, and? Coventry. Coventry. Yeah, it does not say it right. It's in Coventry, like down As the road. A, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And he basically says that um, they have very similar um, scenarios. Both car manufacturers both do Motown. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting... Motown? Mm -hmm. As in like the, the music Motown? Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in cars? There's no Motown in cars. I don't know what car they've been to. <laughs> don't read the book. But I'll read the book, yes. Yeah. Yeah. They make cars. They did make cars. Which is Motown, which is... Yeah. Yeah, so you just make a bit. Okay. Help Sonic. You. Economies. Economies. Just came out by a person named Steve Kennedy, probably Stephen Kennedy, probably using a formal name. Okay. Um, Mattia, I am supposed I'm to be writing your my thesis. You finished your thesis. <laughs> <I'm done. laughs> no, not um, I am working on. Uh, uh, well, it's, uh, my work is an investigation around the notion of aesthetic uh, after complexity theory. And I'm using this after complexity theory because at the moment I am sort of mocking, not mocking directly, but I'm thinking in my head there is a famous book, Kant after Duchamp. Uh, Which I always Terry put on the list, but I said. By it. Terry Dudu, uh, where, he, where he makes the point uh, that they yeah, do whatever because if, if it is an open judgment and there is a cohesion without concept of the, for the art object, then anything is possible. Uh, and yet, as Johnny often says, anything is possible, but not everything is automatically art. Um, and that's what comes out of the dirt, which is it's not mainly that the, 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 the focus of my work. But I, I, I was say that isn't the focus of my work. But the, the, <laughs> the, 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 what I'm really, you know, what I'm interested in, in developing, or what I'm understanding, is how in, um, in the emerging of patterns uh, through complex feedback loop uh, logics, the notion of aesthetic uh, is entirely different than the two traditional interpretations that uh, were embodied to, to the history of philosophy since the 18th century. So it's not aesthetic simply as what pertains to perception by the body. It's not aesthetic only as the study or the material of beauty, as it were, before, before only art, as it came up with um, in general idealism, it is something else which I would like to identify as the emergence of sense, which is something that keeps together material and immaterial, which have been kept apart in Western thought, in Western tradition. And sense is something that is always and only both, and actually the very partition no longer applies once one rereads the emergence of sense from complexity rather than from, from the grounding identity. And how many people understood that? <laughs> you will, that's the best part. Good, good. <laughs> good. <laughs> that's good, excellent. And the title is <laughs> Finitus, Possibilities <laughs> and Dimensionality, Aesthetic and Complexity. What's, what's the title? Finitus, <laughs> Possibilities, <laughs> Wait, say it, try again. Finitude, Finitude, Possibilities, plural, Dimensionality, singular, Aesthetic after Complexity. Good. Like that. We're getting close. We're getting close. That's it. Another kick at the head. So I just can't do it now.
four, four lines long. Okay, thank you. Okay, my name is Bruno. Uh, my work plays around with some reference of virtual and baroque, as well with concepts of uh, architecture and philosophy. Uh, using concepts of philosophy, I've been looking at uh, the monads. Oh my god, good for yeah. you. I've been looking at the monads because of this book that I've been re uh, reading, of Delus, The, the Fold. Mm -hmm. Uh, the one I decided not to put on the course. <laughs> That's funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, though I think. And he's who writes on the monad? Who was the one that kind of coined the term? Leibniz. Yes. Yeah. And when did Leibniz write? What what time period was he writing? Eighteenth mm, century? No. A little earlier. Seventeenth century. Yes. Yeah. More impressive. That oh, was a century. Looks <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm playing around with and dancing a bit with, mm. with the philosophy and architecture. Mm, nice. Uh, and I'm working as well with, with a, acrylics. Uh, it was interesting when Andre said about like he's looking as well at uh, black mirrors. At the moment I'm working with an installation where I'm using a black mirror because when I was really in the monads that leads me to that so. black black mirrors and this almost non space which is a, a totality mm -hmm. and a very complicated space. <laughs> wow, so you philosophy it is a disease. Yeah it's it is there. it is yeah, but also help to create and good. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, there is a book titled um, Contagious Architecture. Contagious Architecture, yes, yeah, very good. Luciana Parisi. Yeah. Um, which is about algorithms creating space and aesthetics. Yeah, it's great. She's good. Which is the name of uh, Contagious Luciana. Architecture. Okay. Hello, I'm fine. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, I study in the digit augers. This is my artwork um, because uh, digit augers. I think uh, most people think it is very uh, fertile and bloody, but I want to make make it to build beauty. Okay, so you want to make something that's beautiful. Yeah. And what what does that mean, beautiful? Mm, I painting on a on a board in a booth. You painting on a. Build build painting of the others, diseased others. You're painting diseased others. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Can you say that in Chinese, and can someone translate that? Because it's not making sense to me. Anybody? Can anybody help? Yeah. Diseased organs. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Of course, he said it in English. <laughs> Diseased organs. Huh. Yeah. And which organs are you looking at? Uh, all of the disease organs. But at the uh, inside of the, the body. In, the, the organs inside the body. Yeah, Even like the kidney, the liver, the and the stomach. Stomach. Okay, uh, and uh, have you ever looked at Gray's Anatomy? Have you ever heard of Gray's Anatomy? Gray? Gray, as in the color gray, except it's G-R-A-Y, Gray's Anatomy. It's a huge book that was done in the 17th, no, the 18th century Victorian study, and they have all the diseased parts of the body you could possibly want to look at ever. And <coughs> they've, um, they've, they, they draw them in a very beautiful way, because they're being very, so it might be of interest to you. Okay. Can I add something quickly? Yeah. Um, there is an artist called Richard Sargent Smith. Oh yeah, right. Um, who was actually kind of tattooed his body based on Grace. Really? And I mean, it's he has got the heart, stuff like that on his back and stuff. Really amazing work. Uh, so Richard huh. Sargent Smith, and and he teaches, I think in Norwich at the moment. Oh really? Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Yes. Okay. 
Okay. And then also the photographic work of Ellen Chadwick. Oh yeah, yes, Helen, yes, Helen Chadwick, yes, of course. Yes, sure. Helen Chadwick. Is very, in fact, the image on the cover of this, the brain, is actually from her Meat Lab series, and uh, they're great. Yeah, Helen Chadwick. There's also an artist I can't remember yet. Well, well, well. He he produced the human body in Germany. Oh in, yeah, and the right. The world. Glass. You know, like there was glass outside, but the insides were, I can't remember the name of the yeah, artist. Yeah, right. But there was a TV series around him not so long. Oh, it was it? Good to go Sorry? Good to go Yeah. Is that right? It might be. And it was yeah. slices of... Yeah, that's right, yeah. There's a German artist that made a piece that um, you feed and it shits. The machine that makes human feces. And it's in the <laughs> museum of something called Mona in Australia, uh, Tasmania. There's a there's a modern art museum in Tasmania called Mona, and I believe it's there. Hmm, interesting. Also, I I might get a little. Well, this has really I'm, spawned a lot of yeah. discussion. <laughs> also, I I I think it's Stella. It's Stella. Oh, Stella. Yeah. And the artist who went there kind of. Does kind of That's true. Stellar puts an ear on, on his arm. On his arm and stuff like that as well. Or, and also, actually, if you just pass this book down, Orlon. Do you know Orlon's work? Hey, okay. aren't you going to came? <laughs> <laughs> How do you say your name again? Fan. V A. No, F A N. Fan. Oh, Fan. Yeah. Like, like as in a shh. Fan. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got it. Good. Thank you, Fan. Uh, hello, I, I'm Jack. What's your real name? Wang Xiaoxiong. That's great. <laughs> it's much better. Wang Xiaoxiong is much better. Yeah, but okay. It's hard, hard to remember. It's true. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so what are you doing? So uh, I'm interested in uh, 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 memory and uh, virtual space and uh, culture, cultural. Memory and what? Virtual. virtual oh, space. virtual. Yeah. And how do you understand virtual? Uh, <laughs> Uh, virtual. I think virtual is um, is a space, but uh, uh, the physical body cannot go go in the space. So uh, this space is virtual space. Would a dream be virtual space? Yes. No. Um, why? <laughs> because usually virtual space is is a, a a state that one enters but is fully conscious. Like for example, in a computer. Mm -hmm. When it, because usually a dream state can be a virtual state, but not all virtual states are dream states. I would suggest. It's a good, we could have a good discussion about that. Okay. Good. But I like that. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Very good reaction. Okay. Okay. My name's Jo. Um, my practice involves collage paintings of domestic interiors. Um, but at the moment I'm looking particularly at the role of photography. Um, and what part that plays in relation to memory and repression. Oh, that's good you two are sitting together. That's excellent. <coughs> you can talk about memory. Good. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, um, I'm working on... Name. Oh, yeah, my name. I'm Rich. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working on... Currently, I'm making kind of miniature spaces. So I've looked at architecture and I've taken bits apart and creating these small spaces that you can move around. And Who's the you that can move around in it? Like an ant? Anybody that's looking at it. Okay, so your eye can move around yeah. in it, but you can't actually get inside it. Oh no, it's for you so. Yeah, so it would be an ant. But size is something that will be right. It's just so understanding the elements and putting it together. You know? Have you been down to the Wallace Collection in London? No. So the Wallace Collection in London, uh, which is behind uh, Selfridges, so in case you get bored, you can go to the Selfridges or the other way around. Um, they have a whole thing on miniature space of the 18th century. And you look at it underneath, because most of it's done in wax, you have to li lift up these little cabinet things. It's amazing. That it's, it might be useful for you. Foucault, Foucault also writes the, the other space, yeah? Yeah, the other space. Yeah, yeah that would be useful for you and also outside space. And then as a visual reference, there is an artist called uh, Casabere. Uh, Who is it? It's a, a South American artist, John Casabere, something like oh, that. Oh, Casabere, yeah. Who used to make small models of architectural spaces and then photographed in such a way that they looked uh, life-size. 
but they were always made with cardboard and paper. So there is a f they, are all, they are very old because the, the feeling, the first impression is that that's real, and then there is something that is not real. So there is a, it's very ambiguous. Mm, interesting. Right. So it's walk. Is that what you're trying to do? Walk sort of the space between real and real. Well, when I first started, it was more kind of the atmosphere of the space and kind of the poetic of it and just... <laughs> <laughs> and the senselessness of it, that's what it started out as. And it's just small because I don't have much room to work in. So. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good, thank you. Um, I'm Nick. Uh, I, I still have this sort of preoccupation with um, land art and prehistoric monuments and the uh, sort of similarities and overlap. Wait, 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 Nick, it's having some sort of bizarre thing that's going on here. Yes, right, exactly. Okay, okay sorry. Um, Can you start again? Yeah, I, I still have this sort of preoccupation with, um, well, I suppose if I'm an artist at all, I'm a land artist. Uh, and um, I'm sort of fascinated by um, prehistoric stuff, uh, particularly sort of Neolithic monumental architecture, if you like. And uh, I feel that, that there's an awful lot in common between them. Um, and that's sort of distilled down at the moment into, um, well, I, I want to stay active, so I, um, I, I want to develop this thing of phenomenological walking. It's actually, I, I haven't made it up. It, hey, but you got the word the out. That's more important. Oh, yes, I got it out this time. Very walking. good. Walking. <laughs> pee walking, I would call it. And, um, well, that could really be very much misunderstood. And I dragged myself up a mountain, Welsh mountain to see a stone circle last week. And I'm absolutely knackered. So I begin to wonder whether I'm a bit past it. Never. Never. And Don't do age. Well, it's just one day I might not come back. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but Any other upbeat things you'd like to share? Um, <laughs> I, I sort of, um, it, it's sort of the, the sort of pivotal point at the moment for me is the sort of idea of philosophy of place. Uh, and I sort of come across a chap called, well, there's several people write about it. I think there's a chap called Jeff Malpas, oh, which yeah. I can actually read. Because <laughs> they're written in English. Well, actually, they're Tasmanian, but that's English for me. And um, Heidegger is very important. So there's this sort of book about his reading. Do you, have you ever read uh, Acosophy? Anything with Acosophy? No, I don't think it's a case. Yeah, Edward Case, yeah. Right, yeah. Sort of difficult to read. But um, no, not the other chap mentioned. But no, that's not a person. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, oh, movement. Sorry. It's a philosophical movement that deals with land oh, right. called uh, Acosophy. Oh, Acosophy, right. No, I haven't. I mean, I think it's. A, I mean, it's to me, it's about place. Uh, isn't isn't just about land. You know, right. It's, it's sort of ground. Mm -hmm. um, so. a, we have a PhD student that you should meet, uh -huh. uh, named Stuart Muggeridge, whose PhD is on this, uh -huh. on this question of how place, space, land mm. operates, and he's making an argument between the relation between the cynics in Foucault, which. There's a longer discussion, but it's not cynical. It's, it's a very specific kind of um, duty that you have, that you pay homage to. I mean, duty is the wrong word, but like a homage to land. Uh, and he links it with the British Romantics. And it's a very interesting piece. It, it might be useful for you to talk to him. I, I think I think where I'm coming from at the moment is this sort of way in which you recognize these sort of Neolithic things, when you mm. start to feel like they call it a tune. <laughs> See that you're you're complaining about reading these things, and now you're using the terms. Excellent. Right. That's um, good. I'm a bit of a, bit of a fraud. <laughs> really got the hang of that. And uh, just you know, like, drop the word in. You know. um, the other one's philosophy, and what about phenomenology? Uh, but um, it's, it's sort of something about if you can ever have anything in common with people who produce these things, it's around this sort of idea of intervention in place. Mm, nice. Have you ever read Overlay of Lucilipa? I, I really mustn't talk in front of the because <laughs> I, I, I had to read that book you mentioned last time. <laughs> <laughs> but for this, it just meant overlay. Overlay, yes. By um, Lucy Lippard. It's exactly about conceptual art and uh, prehistoric stones. For me, she totally misses the point. Okay. I'm not, I'm it's possible, about but contemporary it's art as, um, um, what's the word, uh, influenced by prehistoric matters. Mm. Uh, but it's not about the sort of monuments themselves. But she does recognise that they are art. 
with which I was grateful for when I had to do my dissertation <laughs> BA. So I'm very pleased she does recognise them because she's a real artist who recognises that they are art. But then she sort of does a good first chapter and veers off somewhere. Uh, I felt. Yeah, yeah. Then there should be a big cut yeah, of, of, of yes. land art, yes. It's one of these things you order it from Amazon and they print it off for you. That's <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Comes out a sort of pile of typing paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, hello, uh, I'm Ivan. Um, my work in a diversity of uh, media, I'm primarily a, a sculptor. I like or have been involved around politics for many years. Um, but my focus at the moment is looking at, in an exploratory way, at certain um, a, a political aspects of, around dance, particularly ballet and the way in which ballet has existed in certain uh, periods and under certain, certain regimes. And I'm working at sculptures along those lines. Good. Right, what type of material do you use in the sculpture? Um, I can use a variety of media, but I'm experimenting with a totally new way at the moment. So it's one of those which uh, you're going to keep secret is that what you're at saying? the moment. Well, there is that, but also it's one of those where I'm sort of well, not literally, but literally you know, in the sense of uh, grappling with it, like it's um, who's going to destroy <laughs> with the moment. I'm not giving you know, it. So uh, very <laughs> developmental technique, and I'm holding on in there, and uh, I'll get there. I'm confident it's not going to be there. <laughs> good, good. Not you yet. Yes. Um, my name is Liu Si. Uh, I'm Can you say it really loud? <laughs> uh, uh, hi, my name is Liu Si. Uh, I'm Chinese and uh, I'm in MA Fine Art. And I'm doing some uh, material research and uh, uh, I'm interested to find some similar um, textures and uh, between different materials and to mix them, and to make some illusion tricks. So you want to make something with texture that will create a kind of way of looking at something that will make mm -hmm. you see something that not, isn't really there. Yeah, um, or maybe, um, for example, um, um, metal sheet and the water waves, and mm -hmm. some, uh, at some times um, people will find that the textures <coughs> about the metal sheet will like like the water rates sometimes hmm. and I will do some um, research about it to make people have some um, illusion to have some med illusion tricks about it. Okay, good. Any questions? How many people can say her name? <laughs> Louder. Lucine. Lucine. Is that right? Yeah. Good. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Ya, uh, Ya Tian. Uh, uh, I'm interested in the potential of the confusion to deal with the uh, Chinese LGBT group, especially the gay group, the comrade group. Um, because there goes one sentence, it says that uh, to be a man or to be a decent gentleman, uh, your duty for your whole life is to doing the self-cultivation first, then regulating the family, and then go governing the state, and finally making the whole kingdom uh, peaceful and harmony. So it's very exhausting. Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's a duty to a man, but, but so I want to, uh, thinking about a, a, a project of to calculate to calculate a new confusion uh -huh. uh, and to focus on this this four aspects myself family state and the world and to to think about use this what way or in to what, what extent can LGBT group still to this notion or to do a do a better way just hmm. something like Ah, so who are you looking at for that type of argument? Sorry. Or I'll put it slightly differently. Um, I hear you saying at least two different things, but they're connected. One is how does a movement, mm. in this case LGBT mm -hmm. or LGBTI, mm -hmm. whichever, mm -hmm. or whatever the one, uh, how does a movement become common sense? 
How does it, how does it move from being, like, let's say, outside the society or outside the, the norm to becoming the norm? Uh, uh, actually, I think uh, because the, the confusion is not uh, a relation or something have very district. So I think it's had a full of potential to deal with this group. Have some an, another notion or some ideas to deal with this group. Have some uh, new attitude or new ways to to do something. I mean what I was thinking is is that between Confucianism, Confuciusism mm -hmm. and uh, at first I thought you were saying confusion, but then I realized you were saying Confucius. But um, and Antonio Gramsci. Have you ever heard of him? G R A M S C I Gramsci. Antonio Gramsci. <clears throat> he writes. Uh, he was in prison. He was an Italian Marxist. He, in fact, he was head of the Communist Party. Uh, he was arrested by Mussolini. Mm -hmm. He was thrown in jail, and he was only about four foot two, which was important because people. He wrote a lot, and people thought he was a lot taller because they had never seen him. And when they dragged him through the streets. Um, uh, in chains, the crowds thought that they weren't seeing actually Gramsci because they thought he was too short, which is kind of an interesting thing. And he writes about this in his notebooks. And I'm telling you this because if you look at his prison notebooks, he has a section in there about how movements become stronger, that take on a certain other thing that go on. And he has this term called organic intellectual. And, if the, and so a party can be an organic intellectual like the LGBT, or even a newspaper can be an organic intellectual, or in fact David Beckham can be an organic intellectual, which is almost an oxymoron. But I mean, anything that can move the society, that, that becomes a touchstone. And he starts talking about this. It might be useful for you mm -hmm. in the way in which, so that's in the prison notebooks. Okay. And it's all you'll see, it's on, on, it's on the intellectual, and also how little movements become what he calls integral states. And the second thing is, is that um, it strikes me that you're thinking about a group that is almost being taken as a cohesive entity when in fact it's like herding cats, you know, uh, the LGBT. Everybody has their own position, you know, they kind of are not something, but they are something else. And, and so that also is interesting about that group. It's not, a, it's not like a, there's not like a party line in the party line. And I think that that's probably its strength, in fact. It's like joining a group that refuses to be a group, but that's why it's a group. Something like that mm -hmm. goes on. And also there's a lot of legislation against it, but that's, you know, some places it's shifting, some places it's worse. Interesting. Okay. Your turn. <laughs> well, name, for example. <laughs> Samantha. Samantha. Well, you can do a good drawing of a, a, a balloon. Mm -hmm. That's quite good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll just make it up. What would you like to do if you could do it? I don't know. Really? No. I don't believe you. Um, I can't even remember what I'm interested in anymore. Okay, what are you not interested in? Drawing. <laughs> 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 okay, well, that's good. You're not interested in drawing. <laughs> Okay, well that's good to know that, so if you're, if you're drawn so well and not interested in drawing, just think what you can do with the things you actually are interested in. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, words. <laughs> that's all you can come up with if you're not interested in drawing? Mm -hmm. You've had this entire room to go around? Yeah. That's all right. Okay, well, we're going to have to help uh, Samantha re-remember. That's okay, we'll help you re-remember. <coughs> you're off the hook for today. Oh, okay, you get three off the hook moments like and then that's it. Okay. Uh, I'm Ash. Um, I, th I, actually, I keep coming back to this kind of uber subject of time, mm. um, which leads to uh, like <coughs> continuousness. Um, and I do things sort of, um, <coughs> kind of that don't stop thinking about it, it's just kind of um, sort of like washing the pants. Mm -hmm. And I start to get the video camera out. Just mm -hmm. kind of put it around my neck and walk around with this, and it became quite interesting. Go from different rooms and just watching that plant and light um, So, using. Does anybody live with you in your apartment? Uh, um, well, I've moved back with uh, parents' sister, and then because I'm moving. So, do they um, find that odd? Yeah. yeah. Or have they given up? 
Yeah, well, the giving up thing, yeah. Yeah, and then, there he is, with the camera <laughs> on his head. Um, and the other thing was, um, I got a fish tank, which I found kind of odd when they die and you just flush them. So I decided to preserve them into like little, little bottles. And I've also frozen one as well. So, yeah, which huh. is just kind of think of the ephemeral. Um, for some reason, and forgive me for this, because it really isn't connected, but it's sort of connected. I'm not sure how exactly. But there's an artist named Vicky um, Rhodes, I think it was. I can't think of her last name. Actually, Vicky something. I'll come up with it later. Anyway, she saved her tampons since she first started having periods. Yeah. And she put them in little uh, bottles. Probably that's what it is. Um, in her room, and she's got like hundreds of them. You can imagine. Yeah. Okay. And obviously, her parents thought something was the matter <laughs> at the age of 13 when she was doing yeah, this. Yeah. But she's continued. So she has her all of her uh, sanitary towels for a long time because she's now, I think she probably is menopausal at this point, so I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> now really... A more sophisticated idea though, know, is I thought of... Um, <laughs> <laughs> this kind of... Um, <laughs> drinking water. Uh -huh. um, it's usually like daily objects every day. And, and then mitigating it, so it's just continuous. So it's just this person keep drinking and drinking and drinking mostly. Inside. I would think so. Yeah, so just, um, yeah, just think about that, really. Okay. I think it's not dissimilar to the, the menstrual pad thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, similar but different. Yeah. You know, we'll get there. Okay, thank you. It's Ash. Hi, I'm Jeff. Um, recently, I've been writing a lot of like poetry and uh, stories, short stories that don't make any sense. I have no like cohesion too much on that. Okay, and is that your main sort of artistic? Um, no, it's not my main practice. Like usually, I work in installation. Just, but I've been like doing like installation proposals, but just in terms of space at the moment, and like not having the time to like commit to a big installation project. I've just been doing writing. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Guy. Uh, I'm working a lot with recording, kind of. Challenging it, I mean, for, for kind of challenging it for me. Uh, and at the moment, I, I started this project uh, with friends uh, from back from where I come from, from Tel Aviv. And uh, I asked them to record uh, on, a, on a tape, uh, but not to complete it. And, uh, so the moment I'm listening to the recording, I'm so listening a lot of silence, which is interesting. And uh, the project needs to be a mail exchange. Uh, with me recording back on the tape and gradually it will be no silence but just like all different kind of silence uh, that and how do you do. how do you do the exchange is it doing it by a computer no by mail we just send in the, the tapes back and forth by post yeah. by that, that old thing <coughs> that yeah, snail yeah, mail thing totally and it actually obvious. gets there quite amazingly yes. yeah <laughs> <laughs> i mean we just started so <laughs> I've always thought it would be interesting to start like, the recording and then send it. So it's recording while it's being. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. That's, that's okay. the, yeah, that's interesting. That's, that's a nice phrase, probably. Yeah, that's. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, are we ready? You've been good. You ready? Ready to really rock? Here? Okay. I, the first thing I want to. Tell him, tell him. Oh, sorry. Wanna, let's begin. Yes. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry about that. I. <laughs> sorry about that. I. I've been working on his application for so long. I think I've actually heard it so much. Oh, anyway. Okay. I, well, I'm. I'm my project kind of keeps changing for this year, but basically, in terms of my MA, which will be different from the PhD slightly. I'm, it better be. Yes, it will be. <laughs> I'm, I'm. It's still. I'm still interested in like I'm 19th century printing processes. I'm so. I'm so. I'm basically. It's about like I'm going back to the dark room and I really kind of I'm explore and the process into exactly kind of what's going on. And I'm interested in photography in terms of the materiality of their medium. So I'm that's one area that I'm interested in. And, and, and there's a project that I'm starting and for this year that might be connected, it might not be. And the project I'm is I'm going to be a series of portraits and oral testimonies of black male sex workers and their clients. Have you gone to the ethics committee yet? 
that's why it's going to be part of them in me. <laughs> but that's another dialogue. And yeah, yes, so we really kind of kind. Of, that's where I'm. I'm kind of, uh, because basically, I generally work on two, three projects all all I'm at the same time. So basically, really, um, this one will kind of possibly be my MA project, and then the PhD will then kind of shift into. I mean, do you think there's any other connection area? between your work and Kate's work, for example, who's working in strip clubs? I mean, because it's a form of sex worker, but it's not the kind of sex worker you're really talking about, is it? Like, what what what's the difference between the, the strip worker? Sex worker and the sex worker that you're talking about. Well, I'm, I'm, I think for me, I'm. I'm not sure if there's a fundamental difference, but for me, I'm. It's, it's not very often that you hear the voices of sex workers, let alone black male sex workers and their clients. I, it's I'm usually kind of, i the government and the police and those, are, and those are the kind of voices that you tend to hear. And for me, I'm, I'm, I have a position around that I'm, lots of the ideas around sexuality tends to be in a relationship to sexual health. Mm -hmm. And then I want to kind of take it out of that arena and then actually kind of get back to celebrating pleasure without the health. And for me... Without the health? Mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> Away from health. I'm, I'm, because actually I'm... I tend to think like I'm people kind of bringing these words like I'm people being forced, pathologies or whatever. I'm actually, I'm really interested in those people that want to do it because they want to do it and it's pleasurable. Yeah. And then actually what does that kind of throw up? And then, and then I'm, and then also it's very rare that you are here, you, you know, clients and, and the workers in dialogue with each other as well. And so we can, that's a space so how I'm that, in. How does that connect with uh, the, the 19th century Portraitures. Would you be imaging them in a nineteenth-century look? I mean, I'm, I'm. I think that I'm. I'm. The portraits will be kind of um, <laughs> still based on kind of nineteenth-century and platinum prints, and I'm basically I'm part of it. Either might have them posing as kind of I'm sex workers from the nineteenth century, even though kind of I'm I'm. During, during the 19th century, and there weren't only sex workers, and there were prostitutes, and I think and there'd been a shift. There's, a, there's an artist whose name I've also forgotten, who showed <coughs> at um, uh, one of the main um, art galleries near, um, I can't remember what it is now, it's like in the middle, it's a bit north of here, but I can't remember exactly, anyway, I'll, I'll find. And what it is, is the artists have taken um, current testimonies and then they played them back through images of people in a different time period, thus getting around the ethics. <laughs> but, anyway. uh, but also it makes for a very interesting layering that's going on. And <coughs> as soon as I can remember, okay. this, yeah. tell me about it. it's where the UWE is. Um, I can't remember the gallery. Anyway, um, yeah. good. Yes. Thanks. Hello, tell us. Yeah. yeah, you're recovering from Hegel, so this is no way. <laughs> yes, a number of you are. That's what I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. Nobody, nobody has kicked Hegel and gone harm. That's right, it's not going to be. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm shifting back to my practice slowly and uh, actually trying to have a closer look like from the research which I did for this term, you know, like how it uh, feeds back. So I'm looking at the relationship between the body and the records, actually, what does it mean to, you know, to present these two elements together. So me as a body which performs actions and then producing an image and sound and, you know, aesthetic experience. And then, you know, like pairing me, you know, like together with uh, a projection of myself, which is manipulated machine time, you know, cut, <laughs> cut into chunks, you know, like cut in, into pieces, slow down, sped up, and, you know, like, so, I'm just trying to sort of begin to understand, you know, like, what would be the relationship, you know, like, and what would be the, you know, the thing, you know, like, how do I feed into that, and how, how that feeds back into me, so, hmm. so, practically exploring that, and then I'm thinking that it's probably time for the lose for me, I'm sorry. So I looked at the... Luckily. Yeah, I was like, yes! <laughs> like, Good. The first couple of lectures sound very exciting because this uh, notion of technology, which is sort of always went around because I'm working with a lot of 
technology, yeah. digital technology, and I was just thinking, so why did that actually need technology and to work with technology? Good. What is the relationship between me and it? So, yes, okay. a lot Excellent. of questions. Okay, that's good. Are we, have we, is, is everybody, does everybody feel like they've had their say? Anybody want to ask anybody questions? We're all good. Okay, now let's begin. I'm going to thank you, everybody. I'm sorry, uh, John and I didn't mean to leave it out. Um, no, we have each other. So. <laughs> 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 um, okay, the first thing I wanted to begin with was to, to open your your mind. A lot of you are doing this in your work. That's why one of the reasons I wanted to go around because I want to make sure that this was the case. Um, <clears throat> around the question of how memory operates. And you might be curious as to why do we be begin a course on the timely meditations, situating it in terms of how one remembers, how one repeats the constitution of an image. Because a memory, apart from everything else, has image somehow situated in it. So it's something to consider. We take it as a given that a memory that you think of something in the past, you think of, I don't know, running through the field, it's, you can see it in your mind, it's visual. So there's a, there's a direct relationship that I want to explore with you around the visualization, <coughs> sorry, the visualization of something that doesn't exist, or perhaps, um, as Jack was saying, it exists virtually. We're going to play around with that term. So, so the first thing to take away is this question of how this word memory or rememoring, rememorizing, re re-having a memory, how that creates a pattern, it creates what we're going to call an iteration, I-T-E-R-A-T-I-O-N, an iteration. An iteration... Yes? Yeah, I don't know what the word is. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Bless. Iteration literally is the repeatability of something. That's the short version of it. It's been much longer and much more complex, but just take it on that level for one second, and now I'm just going to complicate it. Because if, if something can be repeated, then it already has some kind of material body to it that allows itself to be repeated. Something's being repeated. Now, in Hegel, we know that the something that gets repeated is a substance, is an essence. It's the essence of treeness gets repeated. You don't have to actually think about it. You don't have to know it. In fact, you can't really think about it. But if you want to get away from that, for whatever reasons, boredom, something else to do, then, then you're going to be thinking of how does something get repeated when it doesn't actually exist? And I'm not talking about the neurological go home and go look at the neuro neurological brain stem scenario. I'm talking about just this, this way in which this repeatability feature occurs in the memory. And so one of the things you need to think through is the way in which this thing that gets repeated and therefore gets recognized or recognized, the cognate means to think, means thought, cognate. So something that's recognized, 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 is linked to some kind of ability to take an entity and make it happen again. Except we know this entity is already fuzzy. We know it's not this box that, you know, this perfect little thing that's being repeated. So that's the first thing to bear in mind. Now, I asked you to, well, I didn't ask you. I will ask you, and then when next time we discuss this, you will have read this, but I want you to hear it today. Uh, just this one little section of King Nestor Remembers from Homer. This is from book three in the, um, in, uh, the Odyssey, or Ulysses, depending on which translation you have, but we're going to use the Odyssey. <clears throat> I'm just going to read you a little tiny bit. Um, just to give you a sense of how creepy this is going to get. And now, now we have Homer, and I want to parallel that with, how do you say his name? Uh, Machunas. Machunas. So we're going to 
See, I've always pronounced it wrong, so it's so irritating because I'm going to have to call on you. You're going to have to be like Machunas, Machunas. Mm -hmm. How does one actually, we're going to sort of parallel it with, with fluxes in the moment. So just, we're going to be starting to think parallel. I'm going to give you a lecture that is in a parallel formation, and you know that Homer happens a lot at a, quite a different time, quite a different culture, quite a different everything. Fluxus is happening in the 60s, in 1960s, 70s, starting in New York. So we're going we're gonna to start talking in parallels. I'm going to start trying to repeat something. So the, the object of the lecture is for you to hear stereophonically an iteration. You ready? Okay, so first of all, so Homer writes that, now again, I'm torturously, anybody here can speak Greek? Right, so <coughs> Telemachus is how I'm pronouncing his name, but it's probably wrong. Okay. Telemachus is, is going to meet the king. And he is with, um, you know, um, Athena, who is the goddess who is taking him through and protecting him on the little um, trip. So... I'll just read you this little bit so you get a sense. So, so Athena is going to give a recommendation to uh, Telemachus, and he, she, he's, she's going to tell him that whatever you do, you are not allowed to be shy. Whatever happens, remember that you've gone on a long journey to find the truth, to find the answer. So whatever you must do, don't. the one thing you can't do is be shy or be afraid. So she puts it this, this way. The goddess with the flashing eyes, you know, um, turned to him now and said, quote, Telemachus, you must forget your diffidence. There is no occasion for it here at all. Why have you crossed the seas if not to find out where your father's bones lie buried and how he meant his end? Go straight up, then, to Nestor, the tamer of horses. We are here to learn the wisdom hidden in his heart. But you yourself must appeal to him to tell you the honest truth, though a man as wise as he is, uh, though a man as wise as he is, will not lie. Now, I already told you that Nestor is like is racking his brain to try and think who is this person, and can't remember who he is. And it's fantastic the way Homer writes this because, you know, it's so human and funny. And it's, so he can't remember who this guy is, but he realizes that this boy has gone through hell and high water to find out about his father. What would you do? Would you say, look, you know, I'm really starting to break this to you. It's been a tough journey. I get that. But I don't know who he is. I'm sure he was fine. Or he's probably a hero. How far would you stretch the lie? Would you say, look, I don't know who he is, just go away? Or would you say, look, I really don't know who he is, but I'm sure he was a really interesting guy? Or would you only be saying this because you feel bad and guilty? Or would you say, you skip that part and go, actually, he was a really great guy? Because you see the yearning, the interest in the face. Okay. But mentor, the thoughtful Telemachus said, how am I going to go up to him? So that's his worry. It's like, what am I going to wear? His worry isn't, is he really going to tell me the truth? His worry is, how do I approach this font of knowledge? How do I approach it? So the second thing about the memory, or the, this, the establishing of memory, well, the first part is that it is a lie, but it has to be given. And the second part is, how do you approach the lie? It, the first part of that approaching of the lie is to not assume it's a lie. There's no cynicism here. You're not going and going, I know that Je suis Charlie has just been completely taken over by, you know, jerks. And so anybody that says it is obviously an idiot. They're not, there's no room for that. The room is, you, there's certain things that have to be accepted. The one thing that has to be accepted is that it exists in some form. This, this story, this sentence, this memory, and that's not being challenged. That's taking as a given. And the uh, goddess Athena is preparing the groundwork that allows him to 
accept what is being said. So this, the third part of this story is who's really telling the story? Who's really remembering? Is it Athena who actually gets Telemachus to walk carefully, to become you know, uh, strong enough to really ask the questions, but not ready to hear any wrong answer? Telemachus is not going to be able to withstand anything that says anything. Other. He, he's willing to withstand that his father was uh, a coward. He's willing to deal with the fact that maybe his father isn't the hero that he thought he was. But he's not willing to deal with the fact that this guy doesn't even know who he is. That doesn't even occur to him as an issue. But the issue is, is was he a hero or was he a coward? And Athena presents this situation where he, she maintains that as his way of thinking about the memory. So is she the storyteller? And then, of course, there's Nestor, who is actually telling the story. And as you'll find out later on when you read this, is that he does this whole thing about setting up the, the moment of hearing the story. And he has this whole festival. And uh, as I was saying before, that in ancient Greek, which might be interesting for those of you that are into maths, numbers are very uh, critical. They have nine bulls for this and 18 somethings for that, and they bring it. There's very specific numbers. Now, you might think we're very far from that now, but actually, if you go read, like, uh, you know, uh, Mary, Marie Claire or Co Cosmopolitan, who am I called? What's it called? Cosmopolitan. Where is this in? You know, there's a 53 ways to, I don't know, lose weight, or, you know, seven ways to have great sex, or, you know, there's still numbers in the society. Go, go to any grocery store, you'll see the, the magazines. There's always numbers. What is it about these numbers? There's something about a number that gives you com comfort. You know, 15 ways, or what is it, 50 ways to leave your lover. You know, 50 shades of gray, not 53. Whatever the thing is. There's, there's number, the, the numbers start playing. When you read this, what I'm asking you to think about in stereophonic moment is how does one tell the story? And who's telling the story? And anyway, what's the story? Is the story the story about this father, who turns out nobody can remember, but Nestor feels obliged to come up with some idea because he's, there's this young lad who is the future. And if you crushed his spirit, you crush the future. So Nestor doesn't want to do that. So. How big is the lie? I mean, is Santa Claus a lie? It's kind of not quite at that level. People would be ruling their... Sorry about that for all you Greek scholars. Um, okay. Now, the first thing then, the, the first part of the chapter, book three, is all about how Athena and Telemachus try to figure out ways to meet Nestor. Now, she's a goddess. They're going to meet him anyway. There's no reason to make all these preparations. She's sort of like, she already knows they're going to meet. They're like old friends. So there's something else going on. And the question is, what's the something else that's going on? So that's the next thing you have to think about. So Nestor sets up a huge uh, you know, uh, festival. And he says, basically, um, he says that Nestor says to them, now that our visitors have eaten well, it is the right moment to put some questions to them and inquire who they are. Because they don't, supposedly, he doesn't know who Athena is, even though they know each other. Who are you, friends? From what port have you sailed over the highways of the sea? Is, your trading is yours a trading venture, or are you sailing the seas recklessly like roving pirates who risk their lives to ruin other people? So it's kind of an interesting question to ask people who've just fed and had a huge dinner with and sat down and laughed and you know whatever you know are you are you you know friend or foe after you after you've eaten <laughs> okay so think about how the story is being un unfolded who's really the storyteller here is it the narrator i mean homer who's telling the story so so he says uh so Tel telemachus inspired by athena who was anxious for him to question the king about his father's disappearance, and so win a good name amongst men, and so on and so forth, now plucks up the courage to make him a spirited reply. Nestor, son of Neleus, great glory of the Greeks, you ask 
where, where mm -hmm. we come from. I will tell you. We were from Ithaca, which lies at the foot of Mount Nerium. We have come on private, not public business. I am searching through the length and breadth of the land for news of my noble father, the long-suffering Odysseus, who, it is said, fought by your side years ago at the sack of Troy. Imagine the poor Nestor going, hmm. Okay. Interesting. We can account for all the others who took part in the war. We know where each man met his pitiful death. But Zeus has wrapped even the death of Odysseus in utter mystery. And no one can tell us for certain when he died, whether he was a victim of some hostile tribe on land, or whether he was lost at sea in Amphiphites' waves. So I've come here to plead with you in the hope that you will tell me the truth about my father's unhappy end, if by any chance you witnessed it yourself or heard the story from some wanderer like him. For if ever a man was born to suffer, it was he. Do not soften your account out of pity or concern for my feeling, but faithfully describe the scenes that meet your eye. I beseech you, meet your eyes. I beseech you, if ever my good father Odysseus is the, is in the hard years of war Troy gave you his word and kept it, remember what he did and tell me all you know. It's like, hmm. <laughs> Cake? <laughs> okay, so it goes on. Now, we're just going to hang on to that thought. Hang on to that. That's on page 51, by the way. Um, and, 50 to 51 of the, of the what this new thing. And now I just want to sw swap over to. Okay, here, not here at the moment. Uh, if you look at your uh, course outline, if you look at the, the manifesto, which is very tiny, the. Uh, the what's this manifesto? where it's under reading, sightings, hearings, beings. The manifesto. Fluxus is an attitude. It is not a movement or a style. Fluxus is intermediate. Now remember, this is written in the 60s. Fluxus creators like to see what happens when different media intersect. They use found in everyday objects, sounds, images, and text to create new combinations of objects, sounds, images, and text. Fluxus works are simple. The art is small. The texts are short. The performances are brief. Fluxus is fun. Humor has always been an important element in Fluxus. Attitude, intermedia, Intersection, simplicity, fun. Now, I asked you to look at Fluxus in like a column next to Homer, because you're going to find that, this may come as a surprise, the Homer's fun. The festivals, the bulls, the dancing, the, the ways in which things start talking. Where is Ha, or not where, but how does that intersect to create the memory? Memories don't have to be only created out of someone slapping you across the face and crumpling on you. So the, the question of the memory, the question of the space of the memory, the question of something that begins, that is set up in your mind, is the first act of what is going to be called deterritorialization. Not because it's scattered, a territory, you think of territory, and so you think of de-territorialization, where de doesn't mean not, it means of, like as in deconstruction, of construction. De, or de, ter territorialization is a neologism. You know what that word means, neologism? Neologism, N-E-O-L-O-G. Something other neologism. Neologism is when you take two different words from two different languages, usually, and you kind of stick them together. In this case, de territorialization, de of the French, of, and territorialization of the English, of territory. 
But the reason it's of territory and not just territory is because there's a relationship to this ter territory. There's a relationship to the way in which something gets constructed. So the very first thing we're going to throw out on the table is the way, is A, that memory is important to this problem. And remembering, remembering, re, re, I can't say this word anymore. They said, Remembering. 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 That's it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. May I just talk for a moment about going over A or C applications to like go in my mind? Okay, okay. Remembering. Is that what I'm saying? Remembering. Okay, every time I can't say that I just point to you. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. That so you have this this thing called memory. And this thing called remembering or recognition, recognition. These are going to be this intertwined, like three three braided item that's going to start to create the beat or the rhythm of how sense gets made so that it is understandable, so that it is communicated. Now, okay. Sure. Yeah. So it's like memorizing what, I mean, memory as cognition and remembering as recognition. Like, can you? Yes, but you brought up a good point about memorizing. Like now, memorizing when you when you memorize something. You're repeating already. You're repeating and you're repeating it point for point, right? Normally, that's the idea of memorizing. So you're not actually recognizing. So it's exactly right. So you know, Mary had a little lamb. A little goat, a little ham, a little egg on toast, a little potted roast, a little duck. With <laughs> Have you not heard this poem before? <laughs> Shad, dumpling white, because Mary had an appetite. Anyway, <laughs> little Mary. Maybe this is the kind of ways I learned in school. Anyway, the point is, is that if you learn these nursery rhymes, like Mary had a little lamb, a little whatever, how are we going? I don't know the real one. But his fleece was white as snow. His fleece was white as snow. And everywhere Mary went. The lamb was meant to go, right? Or it was short to go. Yeah. Okay, so now that is a little poem. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> so Mary had a little lamb, Homer, and Fluxus. Who, you know, this is a very serious Fluxus event that was happening right now. But what's going on here is that one creates the territory that one is now going to dive into. Just think of it that way. Just think that there's a ter rather than coming up with a rational whole, there's still a whole, as in W H O L A. There's still a totality. The totality has the the boundaries of the totality are as far as they can go, as far as the memory allows it to go. It could be sort of fuzzy edges. You having <laughs> the memory is leaving. <laughs> oh. So. The very first takeaway for today's lecture, and that hopefully we'll begin to set up, is that there's something about memory that comes into this. And there's something about recognizing the memory. And by memory, there's one memory is, as we've talked about before last uh, semester, if you remember something you did as a child, but you don't, but you picture yourself in the memory, then it's actually something you've heard and you put it together yourself. If you remember it from the point of view of, of this child, like seeing it from your own eyes, as it were, then it is a memory. Then this is how the memory more or less is coming from yourself, as it were. But so few memories come like that. The ones you actually remember are like the, story, the, the tales that get handed down in the family, or that you've just sort of reconstructed. So then there's the memorizing. The Mary had a little lamb, the police would let us know everywhere the Mary went, the lamb was where to go, or whatever the memory thing is, and you memorize things. You're going to take a test, so you memorize what's going to happen, you just spit it out. Right? That's another form of memory. You need to just keep writing down these different memories, these different types of memory, because they're going to play a big role. And then move, shift over to fluxus, and keep making this kind of, this is kind of like getting exercise. So you're going to be, we're going to try and get you to be flexible here. So, you, so that flow and that grabbing and that thinking and pulling together, 
the pulling of something together is linked specifically to remembering. Remembering. There's something uh, I to earlier, half three, about memory. I'm doing oh, yeah? Not about age and not interested. Yeah, I mean, well, there's a, a lot of things around the question of dementia that I was mentioning earlier, you know, for example. Um, and also, if you don't have a memory, what does that mean? Are you not human? It's a, it's a, um, it's an interesting problem. Yeah. I wonder, could you say actually, you know, when you, I'm just thinking, you know, in terms of like flux of an art, you know, so could you say that representing it is remembering them? Could I say what is representing? And that representing is remembering in a certain way, and you know, this sort of, you know, rep representation could, is. Yes, I wouldn't make it a jump, a full jump, but yes, I would think that of, uh, the way in which one quote reads a picture. The reading of a picture, the or reading, makes, or, or it makes sense, is bringing in, well or otherwise, some form of memory. Not one's perception. It's bringing in this other. It's it's a, it's throwing out a memory. And there's different ways in which the memory gets established. One is the story, the storytelling. <coughs> okay. Bias. Now, yes. Bias. It, it is biased, but don't go there yet. Let's just see if we can just come up with how King Nestor remembers. Because we're going to all play the role of King Nestor, um, obviously, next hour. Um, let me just, just say one other thing. Um, if you have the chance, what I'd like you to do is obviously read the book three, King Nestor's Memory, and get a sense of how this thing is. But what we didn't get to tonight is Nietzsche's Why Am I So Wise? Um, I do love Nietzsche because um, he does have titles like this. Why I Write Such Great Books is another one of my favorite titles of his. You know, basically, why I'm a wonderful person. Um, and you need to think, why is he doing that? Is he just this like complete arrogant creature who just decided to just have it with everybody and just started writing like this? Possible. There might be something else going on. So in your minds, Look at these three characters that are these three things that are being set up here. Through Nietzsche, this thing about the I, why am I so wise? The I of wise. Secondly, the way in which the memory operates. And thirdly, how it is that and the memory operates with King Nestor and so on. And thirdly, the fluxus interruption on this. Any questions so far? When you were saying remembering, when were you <coughs> purposely saying remembering? Yes, I was purposely yeah. saying that. Yes, also I have lost the ability to speak. Well, <laughs> yeah, but I was, because so the member, the assembly, member, the assembly. Yeah. You, that's yeah. exactly right, yeah. assembling. <coughs> okay, you ready to you ready to play ball now? You ready to do the nine week marathon? Ten week marathon? Good. All right. Very exciting. <laughs> 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 Oh my god. I don't think he's a lecturer at the moment. Yes. Yes, we've been Yes. 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 Yeah.
Well, I, I so is it a territory it's because it's sort of, I was going to say like, uh, you know, it has a limit, but it's sort of a mess in it, you know, it's not, it's territory it's not a box, but it creates a sort of space, it creates a space, but the dimensions of that space are not, are they the mess in, you know, they're not, no, on the way home, go nearby. Just, just you want to go like, just yeah. for a bit, not that much, you know, have, like, just to have a chat. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, uh, well, 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 I don't know, I'm going to meet you guys later now. Well, but if you yeah, know, it's fine. Yeah, good. Can some of you guys take some of the chairs back? And make sure that's all, because that's all I think. Is I'll have a look. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, okay. Don't delete. <laughs> well, that would be funny. I decided that I needed to get fit for running the course. And um, so I got a physical trainer because I had broken my spine, so I had to be very careful at it. And she's like, oh, it's pretty good. You just Can somebody switch the light on? I oh, can't bloody sore. see. <laughs> And I was like in a right angle. Oh, thank you. Okay. Can, can you switch it on? <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Well, okay, where's the button? No, I used to ride.